GMG Redemption Week 2, Vikings at Colts. I think Mike Mike Zimmer's built up a more, way more of a foundation than the past coaches here, so he's got that going for him. That's, yeah, that's true. He's been here six seasons. These other guys were lasting two or three years and then getting run out of town. So I think he's got that, but I know it's got to be really anger in him because he loves defense so much and what happened last weekend. I'm really interested to see how this thing works out because it's if they give up another 500-plus, and the Chargers pull it out no matter how many points they get. You know, part of what helped that team from Wisconsin, if you hold the ball 41 minutes, you're probably going to have a lot of yards. That's just, a, that's how it, 41 minutes is unheard of in the NFL day. You yeah, don't get that huge. anymore. So that's kind of has something to do with why they got the 522 racked up. But if they do it again, and the Colts get it again, that means the defense isn't responding. And his plan isn't fucking working. And it's... Good morning, Gallahorn is here. Joining me today is the Drewster and Rhino. The, what Minnesota, up, boys? Hey, the Minnesota Vikings just came off week one of the preseason, and it looked like a uh, you know a pitch and catch scrimmage game. But no, it was actually week one of the regular season, and it was sad. But we're here to talk not only a little bit about week one, but look ahead to week two, where the Vikings can seek redemption. The question is, will they? Drew, how are you doing tonight? Uh, fantastic. I'm doing fantastic. Just got done crunching some Vikings Colts numbers, ready to move on from that game last week. If that's what you want to call it, <laughs> everything is on fire in California. And so I'm hoping the Vikings can catch a little fire this week. That's the best segue I got. Cool. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing Rhino, good. how's Fargo? Oh, Fargo is the same as it always is. We're <laughs> driving through the COVID and we're we're going to get frost tonight again, the way it sounds, so it'll be a little chilly in the morning, but other than that, uh, we're good. Well, it's coming up on that time period. I remember right. Uh, farmers should be gearing up for beet harvest. The pre-harvest should be starting already. and then Pre-harvest is pretty much done already. It's and then the regular usually, harvest starts in about two weeks. Yeah, so. October 1st is when normally everything kicks off. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, I don't have any pre-harvest paperwork <laughs> to look at. Hey, harvesting sugar beets is a blast. I wouldn't oh, yeah. give up that experience for nothing. <laughs> you have that. I'll hang out in Vegas. <laughs> okay. You've got that one. Well, I've, been, up, I've hung out in Vegas, too. Well, that was that game last Sunday. We could briefly go into that. Flip Mozzie covered a lot of it on In the Raw, our show that we have after the game. He touched on a lot of good points. I said my piece. And uh, I guess the other person we haven't heard of about it is uh, Mr. Rhino. Let's get Rhino's, Rhino's feedback on it. <clears throat> Um, well, so, some of my feedback for it's probably not suitable for uh, FCC unlocked. compliance. The, the FCC might be making a phone call. <clears throat> I really thought about that, but I mean, it the defense. I, I mean, I expected there to be some challenges and you know, the young guys to miss a tackle here and there, but that horrendous train wreck of a dumpster fire we had that last weekend, it just it. It was way worse than I thought it was going to be. And I, you know, I don't understand how Zimmer can have these guys so unprepared for a division rival game. You know, the same team that embarrassed you the last time we played them in our house. And then they come walking in this last weekend and do it worse than we had the last time, you know. So, sure. You know, I don't know what else you can say about it other than we're on to Indy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there were some interesting things that came out of last week's game. Uh, some firsts, historically. Uh, that is the longest time a Minnesota Vikings defense has been on the field in franchise history. And we are in our 60th season. 
Zimmer setting those records, baby. Yep. Woohoo! And for Zimmer, that is the most points scored against him since he came to Minnesota. And that is the most points scored against him at home. Which, I mean, is there a home field advantage now with nobody in the stands? We, we proved that there wasn't. Right. I mean, and good quarterbacks can communicate when there's no noise. And Aaron Rodgers did just that. He communicated and called stuff. He would see safeties, you know, uh, favoring one side, and he'd throw the other direction. But did you know that Aaron Rodgers got the ball out in approximately 1.75 seconds on average, the quickest he has ever done? I didn't know. I mean, I noticed that, you know, they they weren't doing any, you know, five and seven step drops. It didn't usually seem like it was. Uh... They could have. Well, yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> well, you know. They could have, yeah. Uh, but that's part of the Lafleur timing offense. Also, what I didn't see watching the game or didn't notice uh, because it was ineffectual, the Vikings blitzed. 42.3% of the time. And you got to remember, they were on the field for 41, over 41 minutes. I didn't even notice that. I, I, I'm surprised it's that high of a number because I didn't see, it didn't seem like it. Yeah. And, and that, that's the sad part about us. If we're blitzing that often and we, and what we get hit Rogers, seven seven, would he have seven pressures yeah, seven on pressures. the entire game? Yep. Yeah. And you're uh, not going to win with seven pressures on any quarterback. Well, in any game. you're not going to get to the quarterback if he's getting rid of the ball that quickly. And, and Rodgers was playing Sad. games. He could read everything from the beginning, check down, knew exactly where to throw to, and was doing that and was executing. But on that blitz rate at 42.3%, that's the highest under a Mike Zimmer team. Last year, he only averaged, or his highest rate was 25% in a game. So that's where I see Dom Capers' influence. But did it work? No. Well, and the the problem with okay, we we blitz that much. No. I mean, it's kind of common knowledge. If you blitz Rogers and you don't get to him right away, he's going to pick you apart, and that's exactly what he did to us. Mm-hmm. You know, he just sat back there and and granted, you know, some with <clears throat> probably our inexperienced secondary. You know, they weren't just dis- you know if any of those guys were coming, they weren't disguising that real well. They weren't disguising their coverages. You know, and a guy like Rogers can just sit back there and oh, yep, okay, boom, 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 and is uh, is Lafleur a better coach than Mike Zimmer? That's a hard not, question. Not that we want crickets, but uh, <laughs> um. I was just throwing it out. I had that one in my back pocket like twenty minutes before we got on the air. I thought I'm gonna throw this at these guys and. That's the reaction I expected, too. Nobody to say anything. That's exactly what I... (laughs) For heads up, yes. Obviously. Because Mike Zimmer hasn't beaten him yet. LaFleur is 3-0 against Mike Zimmer. you got to beat somebody if you're going to say you're better than them. That's for sure. Uh, uh, It's it's a a show-me league. you you got to go out there and show. You can't live on your laurels. You know, you can't be that, you know... 14 year back that set all sorts of records, but you've been in a league 14 years. You got to come out and prove it. And if you don't, you're getting cut. We need Dave Stefano in the locker room throwing around some of that pep talk shit. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd love be- that. Better pep talk right there than the Vikings got all week last week, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm curious how they got, what sort of pep talk they did get. Now, you mentioned the secondary. It's only one game. So the sample size is small. The number one safety in the league last year was Anthony Harris by PFF ratings. And I know you guys, how you feel about PFF. On week one, he ranked 57th. And that's That's not very good, is it? (laughs) Well, it's because Aaron Rodgers knows where to throw. Aaron Rodgers, you know, we joke around and I'm hoping for, for the fact that he's washed. But obviously that isn't the case, especially... When he's going up against a young secondary and he's got a mausoleum to play in when it comes to noise, he picked everybody apart. Now, sure. the corners, that was something most of them gave up 100% of receptions. Not all of them, but most of them. 
the best grading one was uh, Jeff Gladney. But Gladney only played nine plays. And that was towards the end of the game. <laughs> right. Well, and, of course he's going to have the best grade. Mm-hmm. And, but it's, it was, I mean, the best playing corner that I saw was Dantzler. I would agree with that. He was in good position all the time. But he got beat by, you know. Uh, on that bomb. On that bomb yeah, pass. Well, that was yeah. one of them. And he was. But there were. There was a couple of plays I saw Dantzler make that if it wasn't Rodgers probably being able to drop the dime in the basket, right. they'd have been at very least a pass breakup, if not possibly a pick. They were perfect throws. Right. It's, and, you can, and it's I don't think it's going to get better before it gets it gets worse. I, I mean, I, I, maybe that's a little harsh saying that, but I, there's going to be growing pains. We knew that going in. But if you want to help your quarterback, I mean, if you want to help your secondary, rush the quarterback. That's how you help in your corner. <laughs> right. Well, well. And they got to know that. I mean, Zimmer's been football playing, coaching football a long time. He's got to know that the way you help your corners. When you didn't, when there's no pressure on Rodgers, the corners really had no chance. No. They were running those plays on third and six. They'd run an eight yard square out, and it was just throw it and catch it. I mean, it was just too easy. Yeah. So half the time, our best defender was Valdez Scantling when he kept kept dropping passes, passes during the middle of the game there, yeah. Or it could have been a worse score. However, the offense did score 34 points. Most of it was in catch Plenty of time. points to win. You think 34 yeah. is enough, right? Normally if for a Vikings so, team, yeah. yeah. It's more than enough. So now we head on the road into Indy into a spot where we really don't want to go 0-2. I mean, Correct. I know 0-2 is only two games in, but that's still a hole, guys. That's something you don't want to dig out of so this is kind of a there's no real wiggle room here going to indy but now i think what we need to do on this show is maybe what the vikings want to do where do we where does this team need to improve heading into heading into the game with the colts what is the most drastic improvements they need to to make to at least be in the game because they weren't in that game well let me ask a question first okay with them going on the road and playing in the mausoleum because there'll be no fans there. There's approximately 500 in each one. Players can have family, but that's it. Um, will the pressure be less than when it was at home for U.S. Bank? Will Kirk Cousins not feel the stress as much? Just for atmosphere, not you know whether he gets rushed or not, but just for atmosphere. Will he take advantage of... The no fans in the stands like Aaron Rodgers did. You would think he would we, because we would hope so. It's less of a, I mean, for lack of a better word, clusterfuck when you're out there trying to call plays and it's loud. So you would think, rationally speaking, I think we do that on the show now and then. Um, that it would be easier. It would be easier, but you know, I don't know with with cousins. I don't know if that. I don't know if it'll make. Rhino, you could handle that question. I don't really know if he's going to play any better. <laughs> Uh, sure yeah give me the easy question um yeah i mean you would think that it's it's good can only help him now the issue still is going to be you know can our offensive line hold up to the colts pass rush you know they've got a legit defense there's no question about that you know and if you know we can run some play action we can do in things like that i mean i think Real, you know, because last week Kirk didn't really look bad, other than that one interception. That was a terrible throw. But I mean, I I think there probably will be less pressure on him. You know, it it seems like, you know, it's always been the knock on him in in the when the sh- light shine bright in the prime time games and all this other stuff. You know, he struggles. Well, there's no like you said, there's no fans. There's not not going to be the noise there's not going to be anything else so he should be able to play you know and it shouldn't take be that the big advantage tv audience the vikings right packers game was on a good chunk of the nation last yeah. week it was on my local channel here in denver and you know when they're talking indy in minnesota i suspect the only way we're watching that unless you're local is you know sunday ticket right so now, that offensive line. I was looking at uh, pressures given up numbers, which is surprising. <clears throat> Brian O'Neill, 
who didn't give up a single sack last year, gave up a sack. Uh, Dakota Dozier, who I was worried about, didn't give up a single pressure at all last week. Now, the offense was only on the field, you know, a little over 18 minutes, but he didn't give one up. Now, the good pass or rush blocking um, setup we have seemed to be okay. We didn't, we weren't that productive, but you know, we we scored points. But when it came down to our right guard, he gave up. What was it? Seven? No, not seven. Five. I think it was that five or seven. Um, pressures alone, elf line. And and part of the I, part of the reason I, I look back on some of this. Part of the reason why O'Neill gave up that one sack was that elf line was kind of in the wrong place when it was coming through, and and O'Neill couldn't get the right leverage on his on his guy because Elfline was basically in the way, which allowed the guy to get through and get the sack, you know, and we had talked about this on the, uh, the page earlier today, you know, it basically, I think if, if it proved anything and granted he had small sample size one game, but all we did was move the weak link from one side of the chain to the other side of the chain because uh, Reef looked pretty good. He didn't give up any pressures no, either, Reef I don't believe. Well. So all of a sudden you had, okay, last year you had Reef that looked marginal at best, and O'Neill was lights out. Now you move one guy, and now all of a sudden <clears throat> it flips. the one guy's, yeah, it flips. So, I mean, that's something that's going to bear watching here over the next couple of weeks to see if that continues. And if it does, then uh, personally I think it's time for the uh, – the elf to go on the shelf and let Samia try to play. You know, the, the Vikings rushed for 134 yards. I mean, that's, that's not shoddy at all. No. Uh, that would oh, seem like... I'd like 200 run, plus. We run for 134, and you add in the passing yards, it seems like plenty of offense to get the job done. Uh, oh, there was. We scored 34 yeah. points, obviously. <laughs> it's going to be... It, it, what the Colts are going to bring... The Colts had four sacks last week. They're pretty formidable up front. Um, and going into week two, they are ranked second in the NFL in total defense. I know it's only one week, but still they're ranked number two. They only gave up 241 yards of total offense in the first game. And by today's standards, 241 is really low. It is. Right. I mean, that's total yards. That's not just passing or rushing. Yeah, but that's they total. still allowed the Jaguars to score 27 points. That they did, and they lost the game 27-20. to 20. I mean, their offense is third. They had 445 yards of offense. That's what's kind of misleading. They had 445 yards of offense and only gave up 241 on defense, and they lost the game. That's pretty that, – that doesn't level itself out or balance outright to being a loss, but they made some big, big mistakes at key moments of that game and lost the game. But what the Vikings are going up against is, you know – Certainly not a defense that's a scrub coming off a game oh, no. that they oh, no. they no. stuck it up and they they're going to have to. Uh, <laughs> I'm 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 genuinely worried. Not only it almost feels like after that first game that the Vikings are going to have to put up between thirty and forty at least the first month to pull these games out yeah. until the defense gets settled, until the defense gets adjusted, until the defense can get off the friggin' field. The Vikings might have to do some shootouts early to, I mean, I hate to say it, they might need to score 45 to win this game this week. Well, that may um, be, and that will help build confidence in the long run. No, I'd like to see that. They've got they've got to go out and prove something because they did not in week one. No. I mean, it, the areas we're going to look at to get better are certainly the time of possession, 41 minutes. And um, 18 seconds or whatever it was, yes. The Vikings... the. Uh, the team from Wisconsin had 44 plays in the first half, and the Vikings had 17. The Vikings have, okay, number one thing i take care of this week for my key is getting off the field on third down. They have to get off the field, and it was killing them last week. Do and you not realize? only killed them in the first quarter, but it also killed when I, was, when I mentioned to flip about how tired the defense was going to be in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't have that. Between 
getting off the field on third down and making the Colts punt the ball and generating a pass rush, those are probably the two things that we need to improve for me most on going into week two. One of the surprise stats from last week was both the team from Wisconsin and the Vikings had a, I think it was a 50% third down conversion rate. Yes. And nine our to, defense nine was to usually or something. better at stopping third downs um, than that. And that's what we've been spoiled over the last few years. So the defense now has got to gel and, like you said, learn to stop them on third down. Well, they had. They had 13 chances on third down. I, know. I mean, that's a lot of third down chances. You got to, at some point, you got to get them off the field. I mean, these long drives were killing the Vikings, and that's something that uh, that's something that they got to take care of this week. If anything, for conditioning purposes, because yeah. it's the NFL, guys. Everybody's good. If you're going to be on the field. You're going to give the other team 41 minutes of possession time. It's going to be really hard to win games. So, Speaking of conditioning purposes, let us br- let that bring us into the injury report. I will be posting the latest updated injury report when this video goes out. But as of Wednesday, there were a few players on the Vikings injury report. Do you guys remember seeing who? I only saw the only guy that missed any practice time was Jeff Gladney. Everybody else was a full participant in practice. Well, Gladney's still, he was limited with his knee. But there was somebody else out today. In Ngakwe with his ankle, wasn't no. it? No, Ngakwe was, was full he was, practice. Was he black playing again? Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know who else was on there. I saw the Colts. Tiny Dantzler. I'm sorry, that's who I meant to begin with. With a rib Gladney. injury. Well, Gladney, Gladney was on the injury report, too. But, tiny... but he was full full participant in practice. Gla- uh, Dantzler was the guy that didn't practice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I thought, like I said, I thought Dantzler played well. He was in position most of the time. He just had a lot of perfect passes against him, and there was a few mistakes, but it wasn't bad. Um, and my worry about him it was his size. And being small, you have a tendency when you're playing against big people of higher yeah. injury rates. So we'll, we'll see what this rib injury is. Hopefully it's just a bruise, nothing more than that. And, they, and if anything, they can shoot it up and it'll be ready for the game. It's Phillip Rivers. The ball's going to be all over the lot again. It's Phillip Rivers. Oh, yeah. He throws it he all shows, over the place. Yeah, He was third in passing last week. 357 yards he had last week. He's probably going to be damn near 400 this week because he doesn't – when it gets to be the second half, he just wants to throw it all the time. That's the that's, kind of player that, he is. So. That's been Phillip Rivers. This is they got If they don't pressure Phillip Rivers, they're not gonna. They're not. It's gonna be the same outcome as last week. I'm telling you right now. Now, granted, the last two or three times we've played Rivers, you know, when he was with the Chargers, it seems like we we kind of had his number. I mean, last year, what was it? Seven turnovers that he was responsible for in that game we played. You know, and a couple years prior to that. You know, he, he turned the ball over a couple, three times along with it, too. So, I mean, you know. Zimmer has always been a pain in the ass for Rivers, I think. Yeah, that's what, that's where I was getting at. You know, he, Zimmer does have some of these quarterbacks, and we've talked about this before, you know, that he kind of seems to have the quarterback's number. Rivers is one of those guys. So, hopefully, you know. And there again, you know, Rivers is about as mobile as a tree stump. So, if, you know, we, we can get some pressure on him. You know, we can hopefully force him into throwing some of that stuff that he shouldn't be throwing, and we can get off the field by yeah. causing turnovers and that kind of stuff. Speaking of pressure against the Colts, Yannick Ngakwe was in that division, and he's played them eight times. He's had, I think it was 15 or 16 pressures, something like that, and six and a half sacks. So he knows how to get through that offensive line, even though the Colts' offensive line is very good. Are we going to get him back to the right side he's supposed to be playing on? Whose bright I idea is to stick so. him over there on the left? What an I, absolute that obviously, it has to be Andre Patterson, I would think. Stupid. But he needs to go back on to, to be, you know, his normal side and move right. Enigbo or 
somebody else over to the other side and put uh, Odenabo, I keep mispronouncing that, at the three tech. Do something, but get him back in his normal, comfortable position. Not that that helped Elfline being in his comfortable position. But anyways, besides the point. You know, I, I, Rhino's right about how Zimmer's had a lot of uh, success against Phillip Rivers, but that's with a lot of different players on his team. Right, and right. With and a lot, lot better secondary and a lot better defensive line. And against the Chargers through. versus the Colts. Right. The, yeah, the Chargers offensive line's been garbage for the last few years, too, which was a big part of the reason why we had so much success last year, I think. But, you know, there's another issue or kind of a take on this that I was kind of thinking, you know, and it kind of leads back, you know, looking at these games that Zimmer's had real problems with lately, you know, the games against the team from Wisconsin, Chicago, you know, you're looking at these new, you know, these what quote unquote, you know, innovative offensive guys, you know, are, are they figuring out Zimmer's double a gap defense, you know, that's been basically the same for quite a while and it's always been effective, but the guy that first seemed like he may have figured it out or was part of the team that figured it out was the 2017 NFC championship game. Frank Reich was the offensive coordinator with the Eagles at that time. And guess who the head coach is of the, of Indianapolis Colts right now. So, you know, that's a, that bears watching too, I think. It's a huge you know, point. It's, yeah. A really good point. We've seen Zimmer do some adjustments since then, and hopefully he'll do some more, but the whole idea so. of like the starting out slow, like we did last week that we said is a key not to do. Uh, it's a question of whether he plans to come out aggressive. And last week, technically, if you had 42.3% you know, blitzes, you were aggressive. You, know, you can't, just you can't have, you know, 12-play drive, then a 15-play drive, then a 10-play drive. You can't – you got to – some. You got to make big plays at, at some. You can't just you let got, the game yeah. roll. Everybody over needs to play like Eric Kendricks. That yeah, game, with that attitude. That Ke- game, that Kendricks, re- realistically, Kendricks. Look, I mean, I thought Harris played relatively decent for the most part, <laughs> he, but Kendricks was the only. Well, he was all over the field last week, and he was. He seemed like he was about the only guy on defense that really gave a crap. Yeah, you could certainly see a difference in his intensity compared to other people on that defense. But I think other people on that defense were just deer in the headlights. I think they were just like, holy shit, what Rodgers is just burying us. We don't know what to do. And I think I think Zimmer was very tentative on his defense. He didn't want to get beat deep, even though he ended up getting beat deep. He didn't want to get beat deep, and he just didn't want to. He just Everything was on his heels. Everything was vanilla, and everything was... It just it felt like the game, it, we were just muddling looked, through it. With, it looked that way. You know, certain games we watch, you guys, where you're feeling even like halfway through the first quarter, you just feel like, man, we're just, we have, really don't have a chance. That's how it feels. Yeah. That's how that game, but by halftime, I was kind of thinking, well, you're always going to be in it if you get a couple turnovers, a quick score, you're back in it. But so many times when we'd score, I'd say, all right, get a stop right here. And you think you're going to change them. There's like seven times I thought the momentum was going to change, and it didn't. You just keep giving up these long drives of 12 and 14 plays. And, oh, it's just, you well, gotta... And part of the problem with that was, if you watch, I mean, uh, Hughes and Hill were both really bad about this. You know, it would be third down and five, and they're playing 70 yards off the receiver. You know, so all, you got, all they got to do is just go to the sticks and sit there and mm-hmm. But, but Rodgers kept down. doing it drive after drive after drive after drive. How come there's no adjusting being made? It's just the same shit every time. And I'm going, what is going on here? We got You got to at least try something different if, not, if this isn't working. Drew, I, mean, I have heard you say that, I think, now consistently for the last three years. <laughs> Those exact same he, words. No sense. In, it seems like they adjust when they're 24 down with four minutes left and, they're, and then they start scoring. And you all know it's not <laughs> enough to come back. And, you know, let's do, uh, <laughs> I'd like to see him make some big plays in the first quarter. Make, maybe uh, maybe a big sack or a big turnover or maybe even a three and out when we get a nice punt return and take it down. Just 
just get a little get a little fire going early instead of muddling around with you know I don't know. Rivers is a guy that will give you the ball. He'll yeah. throw before he gets sacked. He'll throw it right in the fucking arms. He don't care about picks. He'll right. throw you some picks. So he'll give us some chances, but that's with a little bit of pressure. I mean, there's you'll see if we don't pressure that guy, you're going to see him chew us to pieces. Philip Rivers knows where to go with the ball. Believe me, he knows where to go with the football. Right. So uh, we need to at least come out with a little enthusiasm this week. And the Vikings, that's kind of what I'll be looking at, along with uh, pressure from the defense. And then the secondary, of course, we're all kind of worried about after watching that. But we got to have this game, guys. I, I, the 0-2 does not even look good right now. And I'd like to see more uh, balls spread around. Not just... What is with the rookies? Give me some feedback on why these first guys don't get any time. Get them in there. It, it, it's a Zimmer thing. It always is. Get them in I mean... there. You know, one thing we can say, you know, Thielen looked like he's going to be able to produce just fine without having digs on the other side. But, I mean, Thielen had, what, seven targets, something like that? And Was, was and James then you got hurt, the defensive tackle from Baylor? He was inactive. Oh, well. But, you know, <laughs> di- they, they didn't use Irv Smith. They did, you know, Rudolph Smith. Rudolph maybe had what one catch, two the catch, one or catch something over like the that. middle, that long one. Yep, that long and one. And that was the yeah, only that was the only yeah. one they threw over the middle. Yep. The, Je- yeah, Je- Jefferson had a couple of little short ones. That was about it. Yeah, and he had one tar- drop. I think it was. Yeah, and and uh, BC I think had a couple of catches. What do you guys think of the offensive play calling overall? If uh, we're in a position where we, you know after that that goal line stand we had early on, you know, when we're down there, when uh, they called that down, I mean, I'm okay with the play action part there, but don't play action and do a drop back and just stand there in the freaking pot in the end zone. You know, if you're going to do something like that, get a little more creative, do a you know quick hit, getting something out of there. Uh, so, I mean, I was a little bit upset with, uh, Kubiak's play calling there for well, at several points during the game. I'll put it that way. You could you could build up your intensity and your excitement with your team by maybe doing an end around now and then, doing something, maybe a, a, a fly sweep that I saw that team from Wisconsin did two or three times when they did the quick flip to the wide receiver and he'd get 12 yards and I'd say on the thread, well, there's a great play on first down. How come we don't do something like that? Um there's, it just seemed to me we were running the same six plays all day. Like real base, real base offense that uh, yeah. get a little bit more creative. And I think we better do that Sunday uh, on offense. I'd like to, I mean. Well, maybe he's right setting up with all these base plays so he can spur different things off of it later in the season. Anyway. Yeah, we're, we're, using the, <laughs> we're going to use the first four weeks as preseason to get all that implemented. Yeah, because, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what am I thinking about? Of course, it's right in front of my eyes. All right. Anybody got hot, spicy hot takes? I got a spicy hot take. Spicy hot takes brought to you by our good friend for the show. All my hair off. Scott win. Big Gun Backstrom. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to shave my head bald if we win the game Sunday. That's what I'm doing. I'm in the Raw show. Really? <laughs> All right. Well, said- Everybody, you hear that? Got to be tuned in Sunday, 15 minutes after the game, when GMG goes live for GMG in the Raw. Cutting it all off. Vikings got to win. That's what I'm putting on the line, my beautiful gray locks. (laughs) If I can get my wife to stay on camera that long, she doesn't like to be on camera. So, But that's my only spicy hot take. I'm willing to get rid of my hair to get a win. This is a big time. We got to get a win here. We absolutely do. Like you said, go, dropping down, you know, the stats show, I forget what the exact numbers are, but you fall to 0-2, to your chances of making the playoffs drops considerably. Significantly, yes. Yeah. Can you feel, can, can either of you guys feel good about saying the Vikings are going to beat the Colts right now after that? I mean. I geez, see I, it as close to parity. Um, I think the spread is like three, three and a half. 
in yeah, favor of it, the Colts right now. It's it, it's your basic home team. Yeah. Give me give me two reasons of why you think the Vikings can beat the Colts this week after what you saw week one. Well, by either team. By what either team did. Well, the, by what the Colts did with the Jaguars, or what the Vikings did with that team from Wisconsin. Give me some reasons of why, whether it's coaching, plays, whatever, give me two reasons why the Vikings have the advantage on Indianapolis this weekend. One is Indianapolis had one of the worst tackling percentages in the league last week. All right, I'll write that down. They had a hard time tackling people. David, Indy's tackling. And that that anymore? uh, That may be, you know, especially that may be good for Dalvin Cook, who only got, you know, 48 total yards last week after we pay him $15 million in signing bonus. I um, knew it was going to come out somewhere. Else, you know? <laughs> Anyways. Um, that's one. That's one. Can you give me one more? That how we could win? Yeah, that they're not. What advantage do we have? What area do we have an advantage in? That we're the visiting team and there's less pressure. Wow. That, that okay. I, I, that's right. it. I mean, we scored 34 points last year. Or last week, so okay. the offense can produce if they okay, can, Rhino. if they have less pressure or less, you know, psychological pressure. Maybe they can go out and score forty five. Okay, out of those two, I'm going to take the bad tackling for okay. Dave's <laughs> for Dave's Viking advantage. But the other thing, less pressure when you got Cousins as your quarterback, that doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> so Rhino, you give me two reasons where you go. You know what? Damn it, the Vikings are going to win this game because. Okay, first one, I think, or I'm hoping at least, that that putrid performance last week is a wake-up call. Okay. And, the, I mean, these guys are professionals. they got to have pride in what they're doing, and they, they got flat-out embarrassed last week. You can't go and do that again another week in a row. I said, you know, if these guys have got to have the motivation to, you know, get in that huddle and say, you know what, damn it, we played like shit last week. We embarrassed ourselves. We embarrassed our fan base. We embarrassed everybody else. We need to go make it up to them, and we need to go play like our hair's on fire. That's a good one. I will take that as one of your And then my, my second take is the Philip Rivers factor, like we talked earlier. Rivers does have a tendency to give the ball up in a big spot if you pressure him or, you know, if you can – make him uncomfortable at the very least you know he would rather like you said you said earlier drew he would rather throw it away or throw the ball up and have it get picked off than to get pile drive it driven into the ground so you know if i think our pass rush probably will be a little bit better this week i'm hoping they're partially you know from the Mm -hmm. the motivation and everything else so and with the fact that you know last week rogers can move around and do whatever he wants back there and Rivers is pretty much a statue, I think that bodes well for us as well. Well done. Well done, guys. What are your two points, Drew? Uh, I believe, after doing a little research today, that the Colts' secondary is a little bit more banged up than they want to admit. I think one of their starting safeties isn't going to play. And I think you go after a team secondary with injuries as much as you do anything else. I would like to see the Vikings help their defense by... I know they ran for 134 yards, but they didn't take enough time off the clock to help their defense. I would like to see the offense move their possession time from 18 minutes to 30. That's what I'm talking. I'm I'm, I'm asking for 12 more minutes. So I think they can control the possession time because they're a possession team. Yeah, that's That's how how they're built. That's what they're built on. So Mm -hmm. that's my number one. And my number two is to not to be able to steal something from Rhino, but the pressure on... The pressure on Rivers, I think Zimmer is – it's been brought to the forefront with him. This week. He's, he's big on that defensive line pressure, and I think it's bugged him all week. They are going to figure out a way to get to that fucking guy. They are. Because I think Zimmer knows he has no chance if he lets Rivers pick him apart like Rodgers. So I'm thinking the defensive end certainly will have a better game. Each of our defensive ends had zero in game of skull points. I'm looking for both to be around 10 to 15. Uh, so Rhino, I didn't mean to steal your thunder there, but I got to pile on that point. Um, that it, it, it bears repeating. I mean, it does. There's that take advantage of those injuries in the secondary and pound it, pound it with cook 
in Madison. I think Madison was probably my only player last week that I thought, besides Kendricks, that played really well. Um, let's go with the two-headed beast. Let's pound him into submission. Mm-hmm. I think they can tr- – if they turn that 134 into 200, then my time of possession goes from 18 to 30, and then I'm covered. Mm-hmm. You know, that's my that's, – that's about my take on the whole game. And I'll be wrong. It'll be 35 to 10 in the third quarter. I'll be breaking remotes. But, <laughs> but right now, we could be happy right now, guys. <laughs> with that, any last words there, Rhino? Like I said, we got a it, – it's – only week two, but it's we're already at that point. It's time to nut up or shut up, and I think we're going <laughs> to – Zimmer, I mean, Zimmer's got to have pride in his team. The players have got to have pride in the team, and we're going to – I think we're going to go out there, and you're going to see a different team than we saw last week, and we're going to walk in and beat and win against the Colts in their house for the first time ever. Because I, I saw a tor- Tony Bell posted something earlier today. I saw that uh, the, the Vikings had never won in the Colts' home, whether it was Indianapolis or Baltimore. I didn't. Know it's that. time to change. It's time to change that. Absolutely, Drew. Last words. Meow, meow. It's time to carve up some Viking cow, baby. <laughs> Come on now. Remember, fifteen minutes after the game, we go live. With GMG in the raw live. To I'm get gonna buzz my fucking hair off. Buzz it off. Skull Vikings, let's win that game. Thank you for watching or listening. As always, if you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. And if you're listening to the podcast, please rate us on your favorite aggregator. Skull, everybody. <laughs>